The servants of Jesus of the Divine Mercy invite you and your family to join them on Divine Mercy Sunday, celebrating the canonizations of Pope John Paul II and Pope John XXIII at their location on 33826 Beaconsfield in Clinton Township on Sunday, April 27th. Doors open at 1 p.m. with confessions, a talk by Catherine Lonnie at 2, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy at 2.30, and Holy Mass at 3 p.m., celebrated by Father Joseph Malia. All are welcome to join the excitement and learn more about Jesus' divine mercy. The afternoon will end with food, fellowship, and prayer opportunities. For more information, call 568-777-8591 or visit sjdivinemercy.org. Good morning. Good morning. We have 20 minutes for Ralph to remind me about the, the uh, Magnificat, wherever he is. So we'll make sure that we pray. <laughs> there you are. I was led to this awesome book. It's called Mercy Minutes. It's Jen's uh, teachings of St. Faustina, some of the um, readings from her diary. And this one, just because of the, the number of people that have been coming to the center um, with their personal situations, and, and you'll understand in a minute. St. Faustina says in entry 1333 and 1363, she says, I used to look around me for examples and found nothing which sufficed, and I noticed that my state of holiness seemed to falter. But from now on, my eyes are fixed on you, O Christ, who are for me the best of guides. I am confident that you will bless my efforts. She goes on to say, I feel that I have been totally imbued with God, and with this God, I am going back to my everyday life, so drab, tiresome, and wearying, trusting that he whom I feel in my heart will change this drabness into my personal sanctity. How awesome is that? I think we're all guilty of what St. Faustino was first saying, though. We see holy people in our life, and we want to be like them. That's not a bad thing. They should inspire us. We should all inspire others with our Christ walk. But you see, like our thumbprint that there is only one of in the entire world, God made it that way. God made us in his likeness and in his image, and he planted by his Holy Spirit within our soul the ability to have great holiness and to attain great sanctity. God doesn't need us to be like Sarah or Sam or Thomas or anybody else. God needs us to be who we are because each one of us has some special um, anointing, calling from God to serve him while we are on this earth. Together we make a great salad. <laughs> Separate from each other and alone. We're just a tomato. God doesn't call us to look at others for some special secret or um, to be a, a replica of somebody else. God calls us to look at his son on the cross and follow after him because he laid out the, the way. He gave us the truth. He gives us the Son himself to follow after. That's the example. Everything, everything you ever needed to know about any situation, you can find in the Holy Scriptures. And in the way that Jesus walked while he was on this earth, and as he is now, he is still and never stopped guiding us. When we look to Christ, a lot happens. When we look at him on the cross, we know that if we do what he says, what he taught us, and sometimes, yes, 
Sometimes it's nearly impossible, we feel. It's simply because we lack the grace. So, we turn to him and we ask him, Lord, I need your grace to do whatever it is that you're calling me to do. The impossible. So help me, God. If I would have stopped at how many times someone said to me, that's impossible. You're never going to do it. That can never happen. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be standing here and telling you this today. I know with total blessed assurance and speak with great blessed confidence that in the most impossible, seemingly impossible situations, these are perfect opportunities for God to show himself. He loves the challenge, if you will. Because when something is impossible and it becomes true, it shows that God is actively moving. He's working within us. Oftentimes when we are caught or find ourselves in a situation that is a cross for us, be it sickness, a child suffering, an addiction, a broken heart, whatever it may be, that's called C-R-O-S-S. -S. That means cross. That's it. That's your cross. Maybe a difficult spouse. Maybe, like me, you're married to someone who likes rigatoni and you love linguine. <laughs> you think it's funny, but it's an argument. We fight all the time. You had rigatoni twice and mostatoni. And where's the angel hair? I never see it in the house. It all depends on who goes shopping. But really? Really, one day, it happened. I was fed up. I just reached my limit. My husband just had a difficult time with the ministry early on in our walk. He was sure by the, the you know, the times of having to get up and talk about the Lord Jesus and how the Lord spoke to my heart that truly nobody would marry our daughters and it would be a, a, a terrible thing for our family people would think that you know the mother in the house was out there in no man's land somewhere and he was so afraid of that persecution I didn't have that because I saw the Lord he spoke to me I was just doing what he said probably I didn't have the sense to think anything differently if I were to tell you the real truth. I just did what he said. One day I reached my limit with him though. We had a tough morning. I was getting, I'm not an early morning person. And I got up early because he was on a particular, he was in construction, he was doing a particular job that was farther away so I had to get up earlier, like 5.30 in the morning to make his lunch. And I made him with some of the stuff that we had leftovers from the night before, which he loved, but he would, didn't want that that morning. And so after I was through wrapping it, whatever, and he said, well, I just really wasn't in the mood for that. And 5.30 in the morning, not a morning person, didn't have anything else. I took it all out of his lunchbox. I went to the closet and I started throwing cans of peas and tomatoes and just canned goods all in that lunchbox. He had a lunchbox this big. Just started filling it all up. And he looked at me like, whoa, I really pushed it too far this time. We both ended up laughing. But you know, it hurt my heart. In that day, that morning when I was after Holy Mass, I, I was on my knees before the Blessed Sacrament all by myself and I was complaining to God. 
you know, you just, Lord, you put this on my heart. I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm following you. I'm doing what, and look what I'm facing. And nah, 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 nah. you've got to fix him. You've got to change him, make his heart, you know, love you more, do whatever for the ministry and so on. And I'm going on and on. And I heard the Lord say, he broke into that. And he said to me, Catherine, I desire that you go out into the land. Bring with you a caramel apple to every household and give it my blessing. Not too often do I lose my breath, but I just went, <gasps> and I just was frozen, thinking, I know that's the Lord's voice. I've heard it many times before. But what would God know? about caramel apple in what land? What land, Lord? Go where? And you say that to like Noah's Ark people or something. Not today to us daily communicants or, or whatever. What land? And so I just brushed it off thinking, that's impossible. And what's the purpose of all of that? And we can't afford anything like that anyway. And we were just a prayer group at that time. And so I got back on my knees and it's like, no, Jesus, we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. And so I continued on. Lord, I need you to help me with this and my husband and so on and so forth. Rarely does God speak twice to repeat himself. But he said the same thing again. Catherine, he called my name. Catherine, I desire that you go out into the land, taking with you a caramel apple to every household and with it, my blessing. I got up off of my knees, I sat in the chair, and I tried like crazy to comprehend what was he saying? What does this mean? And so after a few minutes, I got back down on my knees, and I asked Jesus, what about pretzels? Pretzels would be cheaper. <laughs> you know what my consolation was? This. You see, God equips us. He doesn't just send us out. Sometimes he does, but he equips us. He told St. Faustina in Notebook 3, Entry 1023, she says, today I received some oranges. When the sister had left them, I thought to myself, should I eat the oranges instead of doing penance and mortifying myself during Holy Lent? After all, I'm feeling a bit better. Then I heard a voice, the voice say, my daughter, you please me more by eating the oranges out of obedience and love for me than by fasting and mortifying yourself, etc." etc., etc. Jesus knew about oranges, and he talked to St. Faustina about them. He knew and knows about caramel apples and what he was saying to me. That gave me the strength, not necessarily the understanding, but it gave me the strength to go forward. And that following evening, when I met with the prayer group at St. Barnabas Church, my knees were shaking as I got up to stand before the people in the group, just like you are here today, trying to give them that which they could not see or could not know yet, a vision of what the Lord had spoken to my heart. And I said, my friends, the Lord has asked me. I explained that I had had a disagreement with my husband and was before the Blessed Sacrament, just like I explained to you. The Lord has asked that we go out into the land bringing with us a caramel apple for each household and with it to give us, give them their, our blessing. I tell you, you could hear a pin drop. My knees were shaking and I thought, if they never thought it before, they will think I'm crazy now and there's just nothing I can do about it. 
So after this brief dead silence, this woman stood up and she said, Carol Faber back in the day, she stood up and she said, Catherine, if Jesus told you that, then we must do it. And then after her, another woman st stood up and said, I will supply all the karma. It was Helen Morley from the Morley Candy Factory. <laughs> then another woman who was from the Eastern Market that happened to be there that night said, I will supply all the apples you need. Give me a number. And then someone else who lived close to an apple, what do you call apple orchard. orchard had a connection with someone out there, it was her cousin or something, some connection that she had, she could get all the beautiful plastic wrapping for the caramel apple. Everything I needed, the very best caramel, the very best apples, even the perfect packaging. So we went out the following Sunday with the caramel apples, loaded up the wagons, mm -hmm took the church paper and our information on Divine Mercy with us. We went to every household in the area that we could reach with caramel apples, giving them our blessings, the blessings of the Lord, and asking them for any prayer intentions that they may have, taking them back with us and praying for them. The last house on the last block that I went to, was a broken down, decrepit house that looked abandoned. As I ascended the stairs, all I could think of is, <clears throat> this may be my last day. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Michael the Archangel. And if my husband knew I was climbing these stairs to this decrepit house, whatever. And so I walked to the top the door was open just about that much. It was pitch black. I could see inside. And fearfully, I stood this way, and I knocked like this on the door because I was afraid to stand in front of the door. It was around the time when the um, shootings were happening with the pizza delivery people. So that was in my mind. I prayed. I said, if God said this, certainly we're going to finish this out. And as I knocked on that door, there was a man's voice coming from the dark that said, come on in. So I pushed that door open and I kind of glanced inside. I couldn't see too good, but I walked in holding a couple of caramel apples. And I could see across the room a bent over man sitting in a broken down kind of recliner. And I walked up to him. He looked very ill. And he said to me, Sister, could I please have two apples? I have nothing to eat. And I said, oh no, Jesus said one, one apple per household. <laughs> but I'll get you some food. He said he was released from the hospital just two days before. He had, had a stroke. Um, he had come home to a brother who was cross-addicted, both chemical and um, alcohol. Had an altercation with a neighbor little kid across the street and was taken to jail. So this man came home to an empty home with no power, etc. There was nothing in the cupboards. And when I say nothing, you know, most of us have a mustard and ketchup in the, or peanut butter or something like that, or a can of tuna fish someplace in the house in the cupboard. There was absolutely nothing. I went through the cupboards. So I called a couple of other of the servants and we went and got him some hot food. They gave him a medicine. He didn't even have the strength to get up and get a drink of water to take his medication. A couple of the women that were there that day, a couple of the servants were nurses and took care of him and got him back on his feet. He ended up converting to the Catholic faith and coming to the church. He was with us for a few years before he moved away to his family. And some of the, some of the, there she is, Mary Jane was here back then. She helped take care of him and, and a number of us were there. So my point is this, it is impossible sometimes this life. God does call us to do the impossible. But the saying is true, Jesus would have done all of that just for one. 
everybody else in all of those homes, they had difficult times and some had great times and whatever their situations were. Had we have not gone there that Sunday, <coughs> that man would not have made it through the night, the doctors told us. He had been without medication for those few days and no water. Can you imagine? Jesus knew while I was in the midst of complaining before the Blessed Sacrament about a little problem, Jesus had his mind set on someone else that he needed to get to. And not only did he give him food through the servants, he gave him food for the journey, the spiritual food that led to a conversion. And like others have said, yes, miracles are phenomenal. I'm standing here. My life is a miracle. But the conversion, the prayer for conversion and the conversions that we've witnessed is what pleases the heart of the Lord because the conversion is what we take into eternity. I will die one day and that will be the end of my miracle here. But the conversion, the ongoing conversion, we take into us forever, into eternity. So that's the road. Jesus, he knows all about the oranges. He sends the sunshine on them to grow for us. He sends them to us. He passes out caramel apples to us. The caramel apple, the caramel represents, he said, the sweetness of the Lord. In some place I heard that's in scripture. The sweetness of the Lord. It was cloudy. It looked like it was a miserable day that day. Everybody wanted to take the umbrellas. We were short of umbrellas. And I said, everybody. Leave your umbrellas here at church. It won't rain until the last person comes back home. And as soon as the last person returned, five <laughs> minutes later, it rained like you wouldn't believe. And uh, even to top that, we had numerous um, remarks about how Catholics are hitting the streets. And I said, oh yeah, we sure are. And we do. That's part of the work. So, I want to encourage you. Sometimes it is a tough walk. It is the cross that we are called to carry, though. That's what the cross is. That's what it looks like. That's the definition of it. Those difficulties in our lives. Person who is hit by a car, brain injury. Person who's got an addicted son or daughter. Person who suffers with an ailment. That's the cross. So we need to ask the Lord to give us the grace to carry us, to carry that cross valiantly. Because great holiness comes from that. That's how we get into heaven. That's how we have that purchasing power, that spiritual purchasing power. When we go to the Lord with great faith and ask, God bless you. Pray for us. Pray for the ministry. We're on to so many wonderful and exciting things. We just got word of the fourth sister that wants to join the congregation. So we are on our way. We'll be meeting soon, God willing. Um, and then we're praying for all the brothers to come so that we can begin what God has called. You've heard me say it for years now. From this holy laity will come a royal priesthood. God Give us holy priests and religious women to help this community to take it to the next level that God is calling us to. But it's through the prayers and the sacrifices of this prayerful laity that these great, holy, and beautiful things um, are happening. So continue the great work. Continue to pray with great faith, and not just faith, with great belief in the power of Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless your families. Continue to pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.